Hey everybody, this is Eric Lopez, also known as Blue Beetle and the Scarab. And you're listening to Whelmed, The Young Justice Files. Recognized, Uncle Walker, D-0-1. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D-1-2. Hello team, welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Episode 1, Whelmed Season 3. My name is Rich, and with me is my co-host Emily. Hey everybody, in these review episodes, we'll be diving into the plots, characters, Easter eggs, and comic book history of Young Justice, and use all of that as a springboard to talk about the creative writing process along the way. Our review segments will avoid any major spoilers for later episodes in the season, though we will be talking about seasons one and two, of course, but we'll be discussing all of the spoilers from the season in detail in our final segment, Crashing the Mode. In addition to some minor changes to our previous format, we're discontinuing our Intel update episodes, and we'll be adding in a brief mid-roll to our reviews. This will give us time to update you on upcoming events, thank our backers, and share other news. Other than that, our episodes should sound very familiar to fans of Season 1 and 2. I don't want to be that kind of girlfriend, but... But you wish I'd passed. I just lost a big chunk of my team to whatever Batman's got going. I was sort of counting on you. It's just one mission, and you can always count on me. I can prove it. I'm carrying this around for a month, waiting for just the right moment. I figure the moment's now. Again, will you marry me? Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> <laughs> and with all that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The title for this week's episode is Princes All. The release date was January 4th, 2019. The in-episode dates were July 4th of Team Year 6, and then we cut, of course, to July 4th through 30th of Team Year 8. The writer was Greg Weissman, the director was Christopher Berkeley, and the voice director for this episode was Jamie Thompson. Special guest voice credits. Well... At least in this first episode, we'll be introducing a bunch of people that we won't have to mention again. But in addition to our returning team cast from seasons one and two, we have a lot of new characters returning and supporting cast characters and uh, new actors. So Troy Baker makes his premiere here as Prince Brion and Dr. Simon X. Steve Bloom shows up as Henchy, <laughs> the, same, the same henchman from season one. Also, the same henchman from the Green Arrow uh, DC Showcase short that uh, Greg Weissman wrote. Uh, same headband bandana. Same thing. Denise, I want to say Bouet. B-O-U-E-T-T-E. Uh, playing, doing the voice of Lynn Stewart Pierce. Uh, Gray Griffin uh, as Helga Jace, and who also does the voice of the young uh, uh, Anna Von Firth at the beginning of the episode. Jacqueline Oberdor returns as Alana. Maggie Q returns as Wonder Woman. Alan Tudyk, Green Arrow. Bruce Greenwood as Batman. Maseso Moyo as Cat Grant. Hopefully I got that pronunciation right. And James Arnold Taylor stepping in for Tim Curry as G. Gordon Godfrey. The next episodes up, we, <laughs> as we are introducing new characters and new actors, we'll, we'll add those. But uh, we <laughs> probably won't re be re revisiting them because there's so many. So many. What do you mean this cast has, this show has a cast of thousands? <laughs> I know, right? It's crazy. Uh, all right, on to our mission briefing. Just in time for your next mission. After a quick recap of the very end of season two, we cut to a hospital in Markovia, two years later, where a young girl is abducted and undergoes a procedure that turns her into a metahuman, who in the comics is known as Plasma. Weeks later, we cut to her being deployed as a mind-controlled weapon on RAN, where Black Lightning, fighting alongside other members of the Justice League, accidentally kills her. After the opening credits, we cut to the Watchtower a few days later, where we see the team, including Kid Flash, formerly known as Impulse, Wonder Girl, Robin, the Tim Drake one, Blue Beetle, Arrowette, Static, Spoiler, and Tracy 13, 
having a mission reviewed for them by their new leader, Miss Martian. The mission review is interrupted by an emergency meeting of the Justice League, now led by Calderon in his new role as Aquaman. <laughs> I love it. New League members, uh, including Steel, uh, Katana, Hardware, and Batwoman, join Black Lightning, who is out of uniform, Batman, Shazam, Red Tornado, Black Canary, Plastic Man, Dr. Fate, Rocket, and Zatanna, while Wonder Woman, who is leading the off-planet missions, attends holographically. The League discusses the ongoing metahuman trafficking problem, as well as the limitations that the United Nations and their chairman, Lex Luthor, has put on them, severely limiting even humanitarian missions. The meeting ends after a confrontation between Batman, Aquaman, and Wonder Woman ends with both Batman and Green Arrow resigning from the League and taking Katana, Batwoman, Robin, Arrowette, Spoiler, Plastic Man, and Hardware with them. Black Lightning also resigns, but in this case, for personal reasons. We then cut over to Moscow, where Nightwing is investigating a metahuman trafficking lab based on intel from Oracle. Nightwing gets a sample of the tar being used to transform the metahumans before blowing up the lab, and Oracle analyzes the sample and tells him that it's made from clay that can only be found in Markovia. Which allows us to cut to Markovia, where the king and queen hold a press conference about the, their abducted daughter, Princess Tara, and the metahuman trafficking epidemic. Meanwhile, their son, one of their sons, Prince Brian, <laughs> learns that he has tested positive for the metagene and that his sister was probably abducted because she also had metagenic potential. Back in the U.S., Nightwing plans a mission with Oracle to take down the Markovian meta-trafficking ring, and he begins recruiting former teammates to help with the operation, starting with Artemis, who, we find out, is currently living in Star City with Roy Harper, now calling himself Will, and her niece, Leon. Back in Markovia, a super speed powered metahuman assassin breaks into the palace and murders the king and queen, only to be killed during his escape by the queen's brother, Baron Frederick de Lamb. We shift from that brutal scene, <laughs> it's a lot, it's to a lot. Happy Harbor, where Nightwing arrives at Connor and McGann's house to recruit Superboy for his Markovia mission. Connor agrees, and after Nightwing leaves, he also proposes to McGann, who says yes, while I scream into infinity <laughs> forever. And we all we all text Emily to see if she's okay. Yep. <laughs> A G. Gordon Godfrey broadcast then reveals that Markovia is now under martial law, and until Prince Gregor comes of age next year, Frederick de Lamb will be acting as regent. In Metropolis, Black Lightning tells his ex-wife that he's giving up the superhero life only to be stopped on the sidewalk by Nightwing, who tries to recruit him for the Markovia mission. He declines the offer, but Nightwing still tells him where the team will be meeting that night. At midnight in Centennial Park, Tigress and Superboy meet up with Nightwing, and Black Lightning does too, agreeing to one last mission. They then hop aboard Supercycle and head off to Markovia. Well, the theme song blares and we all cheer. <laughs> and Stephanie Lemlin says, recognize. <laughs> it's the last line of the episode. It's so good. Yes. All right. We got some master. First episode, season three. Maybe a little. We haven't, we haven't been waiting half a decade for this <laughs> or anything. Uh, Let's do this. I don't even know what that noise I just made was. Ah! Uh, Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. You want to start or you want Let's me to start? Uh, I'm going to start a little bit, I guess. Okay. Oh my gosh. Episode one, season three. Yep. I love it. Yep. That's all I got. <laughs> no. There is so much going on. You know, we nodded to this. Uh, uh, some of what we're going to say, we've, we nodded to in our Scream Something episodes, but we're going to revisit a lot of these things and go into a little bit more detail. But... um. Okay, let's just so we get that we get our flashback at the beginning. Yes, and then we cut to this fight on Ran, obviously on Ran, right? So you get Alana, we get we get Adam Strange, or they're fighting. But what I wanted to say was was this. So we we cut to this. So it, it it's obviously Ran. We've been in, we visited this place before. They're fighting parademons, right? Uh, I don't, we haven't seen parademons yet. Right. Something strange is going on. We see a father box who's healing a bunch of uh, equipment and gear and people. 
And then we see this confrontation, right, between Plasma, who is clearly controlled, being controlled, and Black Lightning, who who accidentally kills her. Well, this is this is what Young Justice does so well. They take classic storylines and they fold them together in ways that that work for the story they're telling. This thing where Black Lightning loses his powers after after a a, a, a girl gets killed by his powers in the crossfire in, in the comics it was because of a cro- his crossfire. That's where Batman had left the the league and had found him to recruit him into the Outsiders. So this was this thing from the comics. It's a classic storyline, Black Lightning storyline from the comics, yet they folded it all into this thing that makes sense for this universe. Like if, if Black Lightning from the, the DC Comics universe, like, you know, Earth hopped over and talked to this Black Lightning, they'd have common frame of reference about an event that happened in their life, although it happened under completely different circumstances. It's absolutely brilliant. I love this. And the idea that it already starts nodding to the title of the show, Outsiders. Yep. It's incredible. We just hit hit the ground running. We see Ice, who Ice and Fire are characters from the from the Justice League. They were in, mostly in Justice League International, but they, they were in the league too, so you get to see them. We get all these new characters. Batwoman shows up. You get hardware, so we get another milestone character in here. Katana's a member of the league instead of being recruited into the Outsiders. I, Plaza's got a new outfit. I don't know. Just Wonder Woman's got a new outfit. You, you've got all this stuff that just it, it does this thing again. So this is a thing that I was talking to Lucas Brown about, about making, uh, creating a world that feels lived in, right? To drop your characters into. The world is not defined by the characters. The characters live in the world. It defines them and they define it. And we get dropped right into this, even with characters that we're familiar with already. You know, yeah. it's, it's unbelievable. And for me, that first scene just sets the tone for this season so perfectly by starting yeah. off with this thing that still feels like Young Justice, but it's a lot darker because <laughs> we are killing someone off in the first two minutes of this episode. You're like, oh, this this is the baseline. This mm-hmm. is where we are at. And this is this, the level yeah. of what we can do this season. It drops you right into that immediately. So you're not fully caught off guard when certain things happen later and you're like oh oh okay then that's quite a bit my wife my wife started watching the first episode with me and she didn't she didn't even get past the point where they did the the tar experiment and she was like you know what i'm gonna wait for a bit (laughs) like this is much for me right at the moment and we'll revisit it and i'm like i totally get that right she's like okay this is hitting the ground in a different way than the previous seasons. And she'll watch it with me. She's just like, okay, this was <laughs> this is more than I signed up for. Yes. And it does, and it sets the tone. It sets the tone while also honoring the source material, both the young, previous Young Justice seasons and and the comics. It's crazy. Absolutely. And then we just get, keep getting reveal after reveal, right? So we get McGann. <laughs> McGann's leading the team. She's White Martian. She's kind of accepted all that. We get Calder as Aqua, Aquaman is now Aquaman like where's Arthur I still want to know kind of how that's going on he's now he's a father and king so maybe he can't be father king and a superhero at the same time which seems reasonable to me um they haven't referenced him at least they didn't reference him in this so you know he I hope he's I don't think he's dead I just he's probably just doing Who his knows? thing right we don't why not Calder's ready to go you know so, how old was Cal during the first season? 17. 17? <laughs> I know that off the top of my head, and that's a little scary, but yes. Calder is the oldest one in the team in season one and is 17, because he's older than both Superboy and Miss Martian and is yeah, in charge. But not but not Roy. No, because Roy is an time. adult. <laughs> well, technically, he's older than Roy, chronologically. But? Biologically, not so but much. But Roy is considered 18, according to Clarion's magic. Right. So at this point, then that means that he's 24? I think that's 20, how math works. Five-year jump plus six, seven six, year seven, time eight, jump in total. 20, hey, it's actually 25. So we have a year of episodes. We have a five-year We have a five year jump, a two-year jump, and then one year of actual story arc. Anyway, my point is, is that He's an adult. He's a full on no questions about it adult now. <laughs> so we're getting that. Why are you laughing at me? Nothing, because I'm in my 20s and gosh, we don't feel like adults. 
We don't know what we're doing, but Calder knows what he's doing more than most of us. That's fair. That's absolutely true. I apologize um, for laughing. I'm just living through okay. that right now. That's okay. There's just so much going on. And then you get into this emergency league meeting and you find out all kinds of more stuff. So it's been a two-year jump. Luther still, he has been officially, whatever, elected the chairman of the United Nations. And he's been in effect. And he's apparently, if we trust Batman as a reliable source, been manipulating the United Nations and the countries, you know, to to turn against them, right? One thing I noticed, too, was that they mention Relasia. They don't mention North and South Relasia. So... Relasia's been unified from the season one episode where Lex Luthor helped them unify. So that worked out, right? They're not able to go on humanitarian missions. And Batman does the same thing that he did in the comics before Outsiders. He leaves the Justice League because of this exact kind of thing. It, again, a nod back and everything makes sense and ties in beautifully, right? Yeah. And the the Green Arrow going as well, taking Arrowet with him and then the rest of the Bat team... The other thing that I didn't notice, like, I get that Plaz went with him because Plaz and Batman have a history because Plaz, Plastic Man used to be a criminal and he he knew him beforehand. But Hardware left, which I actually didn't catch early on. So does Batman have Hardware with him or did Hardware just bow out? And if Batwoman went too. Are we going to get Batwoman, more Batwoman in this? Like, there's we're only like eight minutes into this episode. Not even. Not even. And it's just like, I have all these questions answered, which spawns, you know, a, a degree of magnitude more questions about what's coming up. Tim and, and Wonder Girl, well, I guess they've been together for two years. And then Tim leaves. Oh, Tim, why? Why are you making such bad decisions? You clearly didn't say anything to her that this was a potential that was going to happen. Did Bruce tell him that? Why not? Why wouldn't he take Wonder Girl? Oh, he wouldn't take Wonder Girl because Wonder Woman's in the league? But like, I don't know. I had so many questions. <laughs> and then the drop of Batman Incorporated, just even as a sarcastic comment by by Jeff, nodding to that whole arc in the comics where there were, you know, Bat Bruce Wayne was like, I can be more effective if I basically organize all of these superheroes around the world. I offer an alternative, he says in, in Young Justice. Like Again, we're we're not eight minutes into this episode, and there's already telling us they're just cracking the world wide open. It's like every single season they crack the world open more. Yeah. Oh yeah, 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 Oracle, we get Oracle as well, which we already knew because we got the trailers uh, that had Oracle in it, which is fantastic. You know, we'll see how that turns out or what's going on with that in the future. Um, we get Jennifer and An and Anissa, so we get to see Jeff's life. Um, we get Lynn Stewart, right? So, uh, we know the, something that they did in just young justice, which is interesting to me is that, so Lynn Stewart is, is Jefferson's ex-wife, but she has the same last name as John Stewart, the, the green lantern. And in the comics, I don't think she's related to John. I think this is something they introduced in young justice, which is another thing that they do in young justice. They take all of these things and they trim it down to its essence while still expanding it out. So they look at it and they go, huh, her last name's Stuart. There's also John Stewart. We've introduced John Stewart. Makes a perfect reason why Jefferson would have even met her in the first place. Like, if Jefferson and John had worked together on the league, it makes perfect sense. Because there's no, I don't know that, I don't think they, there's a really story. Like, when, when she gets introduced in the Black Lightning comic, they're already divorced. So I'm not even sure how we meet her in the comics if they've if they brought that up. I'm not a Black Lightning scholar. But in Young Justice, now it makes perfect sense, right? And the fact that she's like, yeah, I get it. I know what superheroes are like. <laughs> I get this, you know? Which yeah. is, I, I, I think, a fantastic, fantastic connection. And of course, we get Jennifer and Anissa. So I'm already like, well, look, there's season four, right? <laughs> there's more more kids on the team, right? So they're already starting to lay that stuff out. I don't know. There's just there's just so much. Will slash Roy and Artemis together uh, living in the house, raising Leon. Where's Cheshire? You know, those kinds of questions. 
we still don't have Wally's not back. We know he's been gone for two years. Doesn't look like Artemis is dating or seeing anybody. So that's been two years. I got, I got thoughts. <laughs> I'm sure you do have thoughts on all of this. The only, the, the only, the, <laughs> gosh. Let, let me know when I can jump in and I got thoughts. I don't know. I'm trying to think of what else there was. There was just, so anyway, I guess that was just my big overview of the whole like where they were going, just hitting the ground running with everything. But like some little detail things that jumped out at me when Plasma's voice switches to a little girl's when she's dying at the beginning. <sighs> Whoa. <laughs> like little warning, guys. <laughs> that was rough. Uh, Jakuli, who's the who's the super speedster that it murders the the royal family. He was in made reference to in like a some suicide squad. And his original powers were that he was a speedster, but only for like short periods of time, like a few seconds at a time, which actually starts to make sense. Like when he, he if you watch this, the episode, he's just he's jumping in and then he's stopping. He's jumping and then he's stopping. He's jumping in and then he's stopping. Yeah. And it's almost like, you know, Delam was like watching him do this and then realizing that he has to stop. And then right as he starts running again, he just shoots him, which is pretty, pretty nuts. Gosh, I don't know. There's there's so much. I'm sure when you start mentioning stuff, there's going to be more stuff. Wonder Woman's outfit. I think Phil Barassa pulled that straight from the DC animated universe. Yeah, I think because so. it looks a lot. It, looks, it looks like a lot like it looks a lot like that one. I personally, I always get real worried whenever people are like, "Let's reinvent what Wonder Woman looks like," because people try a lot and it's not always good. But I don't hate this version. It's it's different. And the Wonder Woman ponytail, I'm always a little shaky on for some reason, but it it works no. for whatever reason in this art style and with all the characters that she's surrounded by. I'm like, yeah, no, that looks right. That looks right in this world in a way that it doesn't always in other worlds. Right. I I agree. I actually I kind of like the the armory look, that leather armor, like Roman leather armor kind of style that that she has in the live action movie. Yeah. yeah. I love the live action movie's design. Yes. So much. It's good. And uh, she, you know, we had her classic outfit in the, you know, early yeah. season, so I'm I'm fine with that. It makes sense that it would evolve and change. It's not my it's not my favorite outfit, but I've also seen I've also seen worse yes. <laughs> Wonder Woman outfits, right? I like it. I like it. I think it I think it works. Yeah. And like they've done it with a few of the other characters. If you look, like Superman's costume is is subtly different than it used to be. It's not as bright anymore. It's, right. a, it's a darker color scheme. I think Batman's might have shifted a little bit. Like all of them have shifted just a little bit to be like, it's been two years. They finally yeah. updated their wardrobe and it works. We'd seen this art before. Static Static looks updated, right? Yeah. Uh, Impulse has owned the Kid Flash outfit, so it looks a little bit different. You know, that kind of stuff. Cassie's you know, still the same. <laughs> Cassie's it's classic. Not broke, I mean, what are you going to do? It's sweat. It's sweatpants. You can go to work in sweatpants. It's leggings. It's leggings and a Is it? Because it looks like sweatpants to me. Well, sweatpants are baggier. <laughs> She's got I the, see. They're, they're like leggings with a cool little, little racing stripe down the side. Either way, they look very comfy, and I don't know why she needs to change it. <laughs> right. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I just have, I got hit. It was like getting hit with a brick. Like the best, <laughs> what the was? best, most lovely brick the whole episode. Because <laughs> as I was watching it, I was just like, oh, what that? Oh, what? Oh, and now this. And oh, whoa. Oh my gosh. Now it's this Batman Incorporated. What's happening? Look at Steel. He's a giant. I love it. Like, I love all of it. I love all of it. Um, actually, I just watched. I just watched um, Reign of the Superman, which is the DC animated, and Steel's in that too. And it looks again like Phil is making echoes back to some of those designs because he's also gigantic in in that as well. And that heavy like clonking that he makes when he walks, really intimidating. I love that because I, I, I said this in the Scream something, man. Irons is a giant. That guy is huge. So you take him and you put him inside of a suit that's supposed to be make him... That strong and that powerful like Iron Man and it's that big. That suit's got to be big. And he makes Jeff look like the Atom when he's standing next to him. And I love every minute of it. Yeah. So anyway, that's that's for me. Like, yeah, the whole episode was so much. <laughs> there is so much happening. And you referenced it at the beginning. There's the super quick Alana and Adam Strange cameo on Rand that yeah. like we don't need, but it makes this world feel 
like it has continuity of like, oh, of course they're there. That's great. And only Alana gets like two lines, but you're still like, oh, it's them. I remember them. They were in one episode of season two. Love it. And you know, um, you know what other some other show would might do is just like, oh, we'll just set it on any world. Doesn't matter. But it does. Right? But when you do this, you do when you're a conscious creator like they are, they're like, no, if we're gonna do this, let's tie it in, bring things back, make callbacks, do it. Bring that actress back to do Alana's voice for three lines. Let's do this. <laughs> three lines. And it it hints at the fact that her and Adam Strange are still together, because later in that same scene, when she s- starts being emotional about the kid getting killed, he's holding her. It's in a wide shot. Yes. You might not notice, but it's cute. Tiny little moment. I ship him. <laughs> Their ship I've name is him. Jabberwocky. <laughs> <laughs> By the way. <laughs> not Jub Jub Bird. <laughs> does, it, does it roll off the tongue as well? I think that was a missed opportunity right there. <laughs> but we've already proven that I'm terrible at these ship names. Bandersnatch? No, it's terrible. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Going from there, we have the new remix of the theme song, which we oh. can't... I don't think we talked about in Scream Something, even though we both absolutely loved it. And we recently had Dynamic Music Partners on the show to talk about that and talk about what they did. And it's so good. Please go listen to that episode if you haven't. Their discussion episode is so fascinating. And oh, hearing yeah, they're about, so good. Hearing them give words to the things that I felt about the season three opener was like, oh, of course, thank you for voicing that. Because like, it doesn't have the last note of the season one and season two opener and that leaves you feeling anxious just because you're so used to how the theme song goes that even though it's in like a different key and it's slowed down you're like this is how it ends and then it doesn't end and you're like okay i'm on edge for forever now and it's wonderful sets so good it sets the tone for the season so well and i love it for sure and there's so much world building in this episode like we talked a little bit about it but like That league meeting scene has so much information revealed so organically and so quickly. It's it's fantastic and it's fascinating. The fact that there are co-chairs of the league because the league is big enough that you can't just have one person in charge of the league because they have people deployed on other planets right now. The fact that that's a thing. The fact that the leader, whoever the leader of the Young Justice team is, gets to sit in on these types of meetings because they realized, wait, half of the team is young adults now and we shouldn't be keeping all of our secrets from them. So someone is allowed to sit in is such a great little evolution. Well, here's the thing that I just, that was pretty clear, but I just didn't think about. Yeah. Batman isn't running that show anymore. No. (laughs) And it just kind of like hit me. I was like, well, yeah, of course that makes sense. And I like, I think it got it subconsciously as I was watching but I'm like, he doesn't deploy. He doesn't do anything anymore. Red Tornado doesn't need to be there anymore. Like, yeah. Black Canary is not training. And, and Connor is standing right next to him again. And didn't Greg imply at some point in time that Connor had taken over the like training from Black Canary? I think, I think there was an ask Greg somewhere along the lines where somebody asked about that. And he's like, yeah, no, Connor does a lot of the combat training for the kids now. Oh, so I think he's in the just, Black Canary oh, role. Like, I like to think that, that he took over. I her. love that. This, the it's callback so to schooled, right? It's where so he's not good. only just grown and listened, but now he's taking all those lessons. Yes, Ugh, the and fact that with that, with that whole league scene, we see that they're still rebuilding their reputations both on Earth and away after that two-year time skip after season two where they everything blew up for no fault of their own. The fact yeah. that the UN Charter has apparently gotten even more restrictive as time went on, something that we've referenced all the way back in season one. The only reason bereft happens is because the UN Charter exists. And the thing that took me like five watch throughs of this episode to even catch for the first time because so much happens, Diana calls Batman Bruce in the middle of this scene. You know what else happens? No one reacts. And it's. You know what else happens? What? Cassie calls Robin Tim. Yeah, she does. (laughs) And if you think back on season one, where the entire season where Dick is even wearing his freaking sunglasses inside in the cave because Bruce will not let him reveal his secret identity to anyone. Yep. Even in civilian clothes. And now Cassie calls him Tim in front of everybody. Yep. So I'm like, something has major changed going on. I think some level of that might be the fact that Batman was also 
technically Robin's dad in season one and isn't for Tim, but there's oh, some well, level of hmm. more of more authority between like this is my vague apprentice and this is my actual adopted son. Well, here's a here's a thing. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> what so truth are you gonna drop on me? Tim's mom died, and then his dad was in a wheelchair. But then his dad got murdered by Captain Boomerang. It depends on where we are in the continuity. Oh, as someone oh, who has, came after that. But also as someone who has read the comic where Tim's dad is murdered, Tim is already robbing before his dad gets murdered. No, I absolutely, I, I, I get that. That's why. That's I think why he ended up getting murdered. Yeah. But the it's been <laughs> it's two years now, so and we don't know anything about this Tim's background. We don't like know. if his dad's dead, did Bruce actually ended up adopting? I we'll don't see. Know. We don't we'll know. see if, if Bruce went ahead and adopted yet another Robin. We'll find out. Maybe we'll, we'll see. Maybe we don't I'm gonna, know. I'm going to touch on some of that in the Canary Debrief of what okay. I want to see with that. But go um, ahead. And speaking of Tim, Tim and Cassie, they have to communicate so much so fast, and all they do is they hold hands for two seconds. Have Cassie call him Tim, which is also important, and then have him walk away and Cassie be really frustrated with him. And that's all they have to do to establish that they're still together and that they're setting up some major drama with the two of them for the rest of the season. It's such economical romance storytelling right there. Like it just, it works perfectly. It is a gesture, a sentence, and like a look. And I'm like, ah, that's all I need to know about those two right now. Perfect. I want to know if they had Cam Bowen come in to do that sigh, and that was it. That's all he did. He like came in. What, what am I doing? Just just sigh for us. That's it? Okay, I'm out. They might have that on file <laughs> <laughs> from a previous recording. <laughs> you know, maybe that's possible. But uh, going going to a different member of the Bat fam, they have Oracle say say crash at one point when she's describing yeah. something to Nightwing, and I love that that's just part of the team vocabulary now. Like they did it over the course of the series with like whelmed is something everyone says, Aster is something people say every now and then. Like some of these words are just part of how the team talks to each other, which is wonderful and is how people and teenagers work and I love that it's something they've done but the fact that Crash has also integrated its way into everyone's vocabulary I'm like yes good good we are we're maturing and including other members of the team and how we how we build our made up words (laughs) they also reference the fact that Barbara apparently ran an analysis to put together the perfect team for the Markovia mission but Nightwing had already decided who he was picking and it's both so telling about both of their characters in that one exchange like this is how barbara works nightwing has already yep. picked people and yes. it's just such a funny quick exchange but also that tells me a lot about who both of you are yeah it's tin yes dick has a, an analytical detective mind but he acts from the heart and barbara is brilliant and super intellectual. Barbara's and, like, I have all of the stats of everyone we've ever met on my computer, right. and I'm just going to press a button, and this is the team configuration. I made an analysis of, of potential problems they could run into and who could best solve those problems, but Dick is Dick runs on intuition and heart almost as much as he does anything else. He does. It's and so I good. I love that. It's so good. And speaking of the first person that he, that he recruits for this mission, he recruits Artemis. And I don't know if this should be in Crashing the Mode or not. The fact that they include that her looking at that photo of her and Wally at the beginning of that episode. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that they bother to show that makes me not worried about Artemis moving on this season. Because I know a lot of people have been <laughs> worried about that. Not no. from, from both this, from her living with Roy in this, ep- with Will in this episode and crashing the mode things later in the season. Some people have been worried. This, The fact that they bothered to include this makes me not worried. It shows that she is still hung up on Wally and is not thinking of moving anytime soon. Bring, uh, this back up, bring this back up and crash in the mode because I have a thing to say. Okay, we'll bring it back up. But <laughs> speaking of that and speaking of uh, fun Easter egg, the pajamas Artemis is wearing in this episode oh, yeah. are the exact same pajamas that she has in her and Wally's Valentine's Day scene in Salvage from season two. Mm. She's just... They're still around. I like it. It's nice Easter egg, Easter egg, Easter egg. 
Yes. Uh, that number was supposed to be 16, but Greg said he didn't get he didn't get the note in fast enough for the animation team. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, what is it, 13? I think 13. it's 13. 13, think yeah. Every time I've seen it, I've thought, huh, it's odd that that's a 13 and not a 16. Right? I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it was supposed to be a 16, <laughs> oh but he said that he just didn't get the note in in time. So That's... That's hilarious. Uh, yeah. We've mentioned before, and we mentioned in Scream something. I love this idea of her and Will living together with Leon now. Like, not even in a shipping way. I like the Harper Wen Croc extended family house. I like it. I like that it also yeah. shows how much their dynamic has clearly evolved since season one, where they just hated each other. And now they're just casually living together. In their weird extended family house. I like it. It's cool to show how these characters can mature and change like that. Well, and also, I mean, this is (laughs) uh, Roy slash Will was a dumpster fire in season two. (laughs) And you're looking at him here and I'm like, oh, okay, he's older. He's still he's still kind of in shape, but he's kind of a little poochy around he's wearing a bigger shirt but he's got his beard and everything on but he just looks like he he just i'm just like you you feel better yes like being a dad being a dad agrees with you like and i get personally i get that like you know what it's so good oh okay my heart you're just your heart (laughs) it's true though (laughs) and i I love his like well richard i mean dick (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> who are you here to recruit this time and that meaning line, yeah i have yeah i like watching this time i was like wait a second because he doesn't say who are you here to recruit he says who are you here to recruit this time which implies mm-hmm. nightwing has done this before yeah and for a guy who's supposed to be like i'm not I, i'm I, i've left the team i'm not <laughs> working with this team anymore it's like you have a no hard time. Surprised. You're like Bruce. You're like I am. I am vengeance. I'm the knight. Also, I have five kids. You know, like I'm a solo like, act with more team and members. You zoom than- out and there's twenty people behind him. <laughs> He's in the Bat family's larger than the Superman family. It is like it's just huge. Um, but like Dick, he's like, yeah, I'm going to work on my own. But, but then again, we don't know what he's been doing for the last two years. But still, he's at least showed up periodically. And no one no one is surprised when Nightwing shows up on your door and is like, I have this weird idea. Everybody's just like, cool. You need coffee. You want coffee before you go? Yeah, and the other thing that it implies is 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 basically Will saying the only time Dick ever shows up is to recruit somebody. It's like he doesn't come by for brunch, you know? Yup. Dick Grayson, do what do you better. want now? Oh, Dick Grayson, do better. Boy wonder. Yeah. <laughs> Please let someone call him that this season. <laughs> oh, God, it's so good. <laughs> Bring in Zatanna for one episode. Just exactly, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> uh, but so moving moving slightly away from uh, the Nightwing Markovia mission for a second to bring this up. Uh, so we have that whole thing with the speedster assassin that, what was his name again? You knew his name. Jakuli. Yes. That's how I pronounce it. J-A-C-U-L-I, I think. Yeah. Because every character on this show is a deep cut. They could have just made him a metahuman assassin. But no, wait, let's find a metahuman assassin. Let's use that one. <laughs> Who- well, it's DC Universe. It's like, what do we need? We need <laughs> these qualities. <laughs> uh, that, that, that 1948. Sub character from <laughs> it's so good. Joker like, had a sidekick this one time. <laughs> yeah. And it's so good. And it's like this character that shows up for two seconds. I'm like, oh, this is an interesting villain. And then he's dead. But that moment, the the exact moment that I was like, ah, we are not on Cartoon Network anymore. We are not exactly a PG rated show anymore was when he came out of the room and just holds his hands up and they are covered in blood. I was like, ah, so your your budget for red ink went way up. You can way just up. do whatever now. Yeah. Uh, but then in the ensuing fight scene, one of the things I noticed is that he does the same thing Impulse does in season two when he has to like limbo under uh, uh, Tim Drake's under Robin's oh, bow under staff. His staff, yeah. <laughs> right before he gets night winged. <laughs> yes, right before he gets night winged, he like perfectly like super speed slides under under the Robin staff, and 
<laughs> and they have the speedster do the exact same thing uh-huh. uh, in this fight. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. Nice little nod. Apparently all the speedsters learn this one trick. And he, it, clearly I'm, he gets shot. So one, he's not faster than a bullet, which he doesn't look faster than a bullet. But also two, he probably hasn't been a metahuman that long. Yeah. Also, there's some crashing the mode stuff in there. I just realized that we can add on in as well. I got all these crashing the modes coming up in my head <laughs> while we're talking. We've done this quite a few times. Well, I, I, I for the same thing with me, when they showed all the blood, I was like, oh, here we go. But the next thing was yeah. the fact that they showed they showed the king and queen dead. Now, yeah. under normal circumstances, they come in the room that I'll go, oh, no. And then you'd see like a hand or something. Or you'd right? see just the blood splatter on the painting. I thought that was right. where they were going to cut it off. When they cut to right. that, I was like, oh, that's artistic and interesting. And then they panned down and I was like, and that's brutal. You're right. And they're holding hands. Yes. That's the thing that just gets me is that it looks like the king crawled onto the bed and like reached out to his wife and <sighs> held hands as they died. I'm just like, man, you just can't. When you pointed that out to me, I we have that uh, in one in our scream something. The first time you said that, yeah. I just died, and <laughs> yes. then I rewatched it. And I was like, "Rich is right, and it hurts." <laughs> yeah. Why go here when we can go way over there? <laughs> Let's keep going and see what happens. Right. Yeah. Oof. Oh, but yeah, a less painful <laughs> romance thing in this episode is Connor and McGann, and I screamed a bit about it in our scream something as I do. But to go through a couple of things from that scene here are one Easter egg people might have missed. McGann and Connor have a photo of Mount Justice on the wall in the background of their house. And it warms my heart. It's the biggest photo on the wall. I'm like, it's it's your first apartment together. Oh, that's cute. Your first apartment. <laughs> Is a mountain. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> And it's it's cute. It's just such a nice little nod of like that mattered to them. Having that space that they shared mattered to them. And we're just bringing it into season three. I like it. They have their whole that scene opens with them having a telepathic conversation. And it's great because it's things we've talked about in our scream something. It's them talking through some issues. It's them talking about their concerns. It's McGann offering endless reassurances that Connor is doing the right thing and will do the right thing. Because she's like, no, no, don't you don't have to question yourself that much. And I like that. I appreciate that. I appreciate them showing that Connor, by this point in the series, is a really good moral compass that we like don't see in season one, but you see that in season two. And they're bringing it up in season three of like, Connor has a very grounded sense of like who he is and right and wrong. And that's good. And I like it. And just the fact that they made that scene between them so casual and so comfortable with the two of them just quickly establishes that this is a good ongoing thing for them. And it's so good. It's again, it's economical romance storytelling. If you'd shown them out on a date, that would not have the same impact that two people sitting down and having coffee casually in their shared home does. My wife and I talk about this all the time, the representation of the guy. One of the reasons this is, Oh, personal, I guess. But like one of the reasons I had apprehensions about becoming a dad is because the only examples I had of being a dad was either my dad, who's who's a nice, really smart, interesting guy, but I'm not my dad. So I can't be a dad like my dad. And the only other examples were all the bumbling morons that were on television. Yeah. That just ignored everybody and did stupid crap and tried to fix something and blew up the house instead or whatever, like never making the right decisions, never doing something that was helpful. Yeah. It was terrible. And, you know, and then I learned I could just be me and be a dad and that's okay too. (laughs) But now we're getting to a time frame where we're getting to see representation of, you know, for lack of a better phrase, really non-toxic masculine ways of being in a relationship and being in a healthy relationship that involves conversation and being able to see two people just talking out their problems over a cup of coffee. That's a relationship. Yeah. It's not the, just the romance part. It's yeah. the living every day part. And that that part's the hard part, yeah. right? You know, aside from the fact that your now fiance once upon a time tried to gaslight you that you have to work through, right? But they had to do that and they have to. And the only way you can get past that is by doing the work every single day with every little thing that you do. 
Yeah. And they're clearly doing that. And I just, I love that if, if somebody's, you know, younger in their teens or whatever, PG 13 and up watching this, they get some kind of an example of somebody having a, the drama doesn't have to come from just making terrible decisions and not, and lying to people. I, the hill I will die on is that you do not have to make relationships complicated to make them compelling in yeah. that way that so many TV shows decide, oh, we have another season and this couple got together. Well, they can't be together because if they're together, then it's boring. Like, no, I will watch a show where two people are happily together and working out problems that are not about them cheating on each other or doing stupid things and keeping secrets from each right. other. Like, you can just have two people be together. Being you know, in love is interesting enough on its own. It does not need that kind of drama. Dig past the cliches. Keep thinking. You know, keep thinking more about what's going on. I don't know. So, yes. Anyway. <laughs> Getting down off that soapbox for right. a second. Little mini super sweethearts there for you. Guys. Yes. What gets me about this proposal scene, because I've talked on and on about how I, I love this proposal. I'm so happy for these characters. I'm so happy for myself. I happy cried because my 13-year-old self was screaming internally and was so happy to see these characters together. The thing that gets me about that scene is when Connor says, I've been carrying this around for a month. Because like that moment could have so easily come off as like a spur of the moment trying to appease my girlfriend who's kind of annoyed at me for making this decision. Like it mm -hmm. could have come off as that. But including that line establishes that Connor has been thinking about this for a while and has only now just gone, I think this is the right time to do this. Like this is not out of, the he's prepared. He is prepared for this moment and it's so, I'm so good. Now I'm laughing, but it's something. It just makes me realize, is there like diamond cut, princess cut, and Superman cut? Is now just like a normal diamond cut like that's available? Someone, I don't remember who it was. Would you like the Kryptonian cut or would you like the princess? You know, like, <laughs> it's got to. Someone on Twitter pointed out the concept. I forget who it was, but someone on Twitter pointed out the idea of what if, what if Connor did a thing that Superman has done in the comics several times, which is create that diamond oh, Create himself. the diamond himself? Yeah. Because I don't think could. Superboy's that strong. Like, but we don't know. Either well, way. Well, I'm, I'm unconvinced that this, that this era's Superman is that strong. This was definitely a 60s, I'm going to move the planets around level I of agree. Superman power. I agree. I'm but this is what he used to do. He, he used to like take a piece of coal and he would like use his heat vision and crush it in his hand and make diamond. I'm like, you're ruining the, ruining the like economy at this point, <laughs> Superman. Yes. But that was thrown out as a concept somewhere along the lines. But either way. Whatever way he got a Superman <laughs> loco shaped ring, I <laughs> and I love it. It's so cute. It's such a good little thing. Because right. McGann would absolutely also love that. Like that's the thing. McGann would be like, "Yes, no, I'm here for this." It just it does it. At first, I was like, "Oh, that's kind of." I mean, it it's cute. It's funny. It's definitely more him than her kind of thing, and like giving her that. But then I remembered, like, I like the moment the, the he, that. And also, but really, like the psychic battle she has with Simon, where she brings yep. up the shield that is representative of Connor, that kind of stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, this, okay, now I, this is great. Now I get it. I get yes. that more. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. It's, it's a good. Okay. I have my last two things. My last two points here are, we talked about this in Scream Something and our crashing the mode in Scream Something uh, for this episode, but I'll bring it up here real quick. The fact that we see this proposal in the first episode of the season means that this isn't a story about how Connor decided to propose. That is a storyline they could have totally done and easily done and would have been fun and silly and great. But this is a story about how two superheroes deal with being engaged. And we will see more of it this season. We already know that from the first half. And whether or not we see a we wedding this season, this is a romantic subplot that results from a proposal, not one that leads to a proposal, which right. is different and interesting and fascinating. And we will see where it goes. We don't know yet. I love and it. finally, you and me and everyone else on the planet cried about that first ending thing with Bruce Lee holding the Kid Flash plushie. Oh. 
Oh, uh, it's brutal. And it was the first time we'd gotten one of those ending sequences. We didn't know what they were going to be, and they hurt our heart in the best possible way. But I do want to throw out the fact that I remember a lot of people when it first came out, they were like, they should totally make that plushie a thing. I would buy that plushie. That's so cute. They have, actually. They, they, uh, yeah, it's out there. there. There is a Funko Kid Flash s- stuffed animal available from Hot Topic. <laughs> stuffed Speedster. St- <laughs> little plushie. It's very cute. It, you can get it from Hot Topic from the website or from your local Hot Topic. It's a Hot Topic exclusive, so that's the only reason I'm mentioning them specifically. And it's real cute. I bought it from my friend for Christmas, and she loves it. It's it's very huggable. Buy a couple. Give one to your dog. <laughs> so if you have a pit bull and you go and right. buy the Kid Flash plushie, <laughs> you too can have your own that's heartbreaking right. Bruce Lee photo shoot. <laughs> Stephanie Lemon's got to do that with Bruce Lee. <laughs> Kind of do it. It's so good. A um, couple of things from Neil. Neil, yes. our, mas- our master of the 16s. Very first timestamp <laughs> that has that sweet, sweet 16. I'm quoting Neil. Sorry. sorry. So the, the, there, there are six different timestamps that have 16s in them. Yes. Uh, cut to the RAN, July 16th, 0016. The 24-hour time standard is kept using the precise atomic clocks combined with Earth's rotation. This is the co- the coordinated universal time. So it, it it's got to be something, some way for them to be able to coordinate time frames when they're off the off world. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, Gregor was born 16 minutes before Brian, because of course he was. <laughs> because because it course. couldn't be 52 minutes. Right. Right. Um, and then Neil pointed out that actually uh, Wolf notices that Dick is coming up to the front door before he knocks yeah. <laughs> and then goes back to sleep. He does. He's good. He's still He's got all of his enhanced senses, even if he is sleeping. He's a sleeper. Neil also pointed out, uh, he mentioned this on DC Daily, if people have been keeping up with that in our most recent thing. I mentioned, mentioned it? Fa- no. Uh, Neil mentioned the fact oh. that uh, Anna, uh, her brother, Otto, is told that oh, her heart right. gave out and that is how she dies. <laughs> It's just not exactly how it seems yes. when it's first said because black lightning shocking her does right. make her heart give out. So this is something that I noticed because I'm a, I'm a nurse that used to work in a cardiac ward. <laughs> so if you mention that someone's heart's having a problem and then her heart gave out when she was shocked, that's why she died because of the electric shock. But also, <laughs> this is strange, the heart that they drew is anatomically pretty close, and, and it, but it's got a bit of a malformation in the upper left-hand side. Could be the uh, one of the atriums that they drew because of whatever the source material was, but it actually looks like she has what an aneurysm that's actually in the atrium of the heart. So that's a thing that I was watching at the time. So as soon as he hit her, and then she started grab like like having issues, and they showed the heart, I was just like, "Oh, oh, this is not going well." Yeah, for saddening, I think uh, Hector uh, Navarro yes, said. I believe I believe that is the term he coined. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, I. Okay. So there's a lot of Aster. Yes. And this is, uh, we've already gone almost as long as we went on our Scream Something (laughs) on three episodes. uh, And we still haven't hit anything else. So let's, uh, we're going to roll into the mid roll. And then after the mid roll, we're going to pick up with some Canary Debrief, uh, some fan service, and then some Crashing the Mode. Uh, For those people who don't want to be spoiled, um, after Crashing the Mode, it's just going to be some credits and some things like that. So you're welcome to uh, skip through Crashing the Mode to the end there. Ah, yeah. Uh, welcome to the Fake Your Own Death Club. Its membership is very exclusive, and I'm the president. Hello, team, and welcome to the mid-roll. First of all, we'd like to welcome a lot of new listeners. In January alone, our download numbers have tripled. We've topped 100 five-star ratings on Apple Podcasts, and new listener reviews just keep coming in. Whether you saw us on social media, caught us on DC Daily, or heard about us from a friend, thank you, and we're glad you're here. Now that our review episodes have resumed, you'll be getting a new one every Wednesday. We won't be returning to our previous two-per-week-every-week schedule, but when we have non-review material recorded, like discussion sessions, interviews, the new Secret Origins Into the Light, uh, Elseworlds DC animated reviews, or Super Sweethearts, we'll be airing those as bonus episodes during the same week as a review airs whenever the editing is done. For those backing us on Patreon, we can't thank you enough. Even a dollar a month is a huge help. And so far, it you've helped us pay to attend conventions, to do a fan gathering, 
uh, to help us pay for hotels and new equipment for Neil and I to go to Burbank to do on-site interviews and so much more. We've been asked about whether or not we're going to do ads and had some people request to do ads on the show. And it's not something we're considering at the moment, but our attendance at non-local events and conventions is limited by our personal funds. So our Patreon backers have allowed a lot of new material to be created while helping us remain ad-free. We will be revamping and updating the Patreon soon to offer additional rewards, and we're currently working on our merchandise store as well, which will allow listeners to help us out by picking up hoodies, shirts, mugs, and more. We'll have more info on that soon. Finally, I want to remind everyone that the best way that you can support us is non-monetary, actually, and that's by telling a friend about us, posting a review, or even just clicking on the five-star rating in Apple Podcasts. I know we say this at the end of every show, but I want to reemphasize it here. Clicking on a, a rating for your favorite podcast, whoever they might be, it just takes seconds. And if just 10% of our listeners gave us a rating, our show would shoot up in the search strings. And so even without a review, even just the ratings, I, we appreciate every single one. So thank you. And with all that out of the way, let's get back to the show. Stick around. Class is in session. So this week in the Canary Debrief, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the most controversial storytelling aspect of Young Justice, which is the time jumps. Since the first episode, uh, we're now in team year eight, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, with a five-year time jump, a two-year time jump, and one year of story that took place over two seasons. There are obvious downsides to the jumps. Largely in that we are introduced to a universe of characters over that time and may not get enough time with our favorites, whoever they happen to be. The upside, though, is that the time jumps are setting us up to see something that we haven't seen in any animated or live action TV show or comic that I can think of and highlights the cornerstone of what makes the DC universe unique among comic companies. And that's legacy heroes. Now that we have additional seasons, or the hope for more after this one anyway, since we haven't had an announcement yet, we'll be able to see these effects. Characters like Sissy King, Sissy King Jones, who was first seen as a young girl in season one, looking up at Artemis, saving her father, and being inspired by her heroism, can become heroes like Arouette. We get to see Calder fulfill his destiny and training and becoming the new Aquaman. We see McGann through an eight-year arc of character growth to become what we can only hope is her best self. Shazam! Billy Batson has grown from a 10-year-old to an 18-year-old at this point, and I don't know of any time in DC history that we've gotten stories about an 18-year-old Billy Batson. Young Justice is far more than a story about young heroes fighting villains in a vacuum. It's about young heroes and their place in a larger universe a universe with a rich history, a complex present, and wide-ranging consequences from their actions felt far into the future. Yes, unfortunately, the show has a limited time to tell us stories in this world and needs to put its spotlight on specific through lines to make a cohesive season, but what it does is opens the door for spinoffs, tie-in comics, and if, if I had my way, an entire DC Young Justice imprint that grants new readers an easy on-ramp to the nonstop, heavy-moving freeway of mainstream comics. We'll be having a, there's a special guest coming on in a, in a future discussion session to dive much, much deeper into the consequences and implications of a set timeline, as well as how it relates to DC's history and how both Marvel and DC have dealt with this unique, evolving storytelling uh, aspect of comics. But until then, I hope you can see that the benefits and foundational implications of a set timeline is what gives us the incredible stories that we've gotten so far and sets us up for some spectacular and original storytelling to come. All right. And with all that, let's get into some fan service. Emily, you have some fan service for us today? I do. I do. I've uh, admired your stance on animal rights for years. Uh, in fan service, we'll take some time to highlight the amazing fan-related creations that celebrate DC, Young Justice, and other creative works that we think Young Justice fans will love. And this week, Emily's got some fan service for us. I do. This week, I have a 
collection of art, I'll say, uh, from a Tumblr artist known as Mintai. That's how I'm going with pronouncing it. We'll have the link down in the description so you don't have to rely on my pronunciation, uh, who went and drew the original six members of the Young Justice team. So Kid Flash, Aqualad, Robin, Superboy, Artemis, and Miss Martian in these really cool, like casual character portraits that feature them surrounded by objects that like represent them stuff that would be in their backpacks or bedrooms or lockers and it's really cool you get these cool little stories of like these are things that matter to these characters and fun little jokes about who they are in season one and it's just really cool the art style is great the concept behind it is so cool i just i love it tell them about the phones (laughs) (laughs) there are some great little nods uh throughout the whole thing of different things like Superboy includes two phones, one of them being a completely shattered smartphone and the other one being like an old school Nokia brick phone that is perfectly intact. <laughs> Ms. Martians has like a one of the little green aliens from Toy Story as like a keychain on her backpack. Uh, Artemis has a copy of Alice in Wonderland. Calder has a water bottle because of course he does. <laughs> 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 and just cool little things like that. There are so many snacks surrounding Wally. <laughs> so many snacks. So many snacks. And Robin has a cute little little plushie of a circus elephant with him. That I'm like, oh, that's Titano. Point, His friend Titano from Haley Circus. Don't make me yes, cry. Yes, it's so good. Definitely check it out. Look at all of the wonderful little details because it's so detail oriented, and I love it. And check it out. Awesome. All right. Let's get into some crashing the mode. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. Our earlier segments assume listeners have only seen up to this episode in season three. In crashing the mode, we'll be discussing spoilers and foreshadowing for future episodes, as well as plot elements from the original DC storylines that may affect what we see later on. We may also drop theories and speculation about what's to come based on wild flights of fancy. Uh, these spoilers <laughs> will be based on knowledge. <laughs> maybe sometimes I feel like we're just want something <laughs> <We're> throwing <laughs> ideas into the wind <laughs> right uh, these spoilers will be based uh, on only the first 13 episodes if you're listening in the far flung future uh, as that's what uh, all we've seen at this time but if you're spoiler wary at all uh, this is your warning and you can skip past this into the end credits there should be the right timestamp down in the show notes for you to skip that's- ahead that's Cause, Neil's magic. Because Neil is magic. <laughs> Why don't you, st- before we get into this, though, I got this thing about Jace's daughter. Yeah. And I, I don't know. Do you want to hear it? Should, I don't know if we should put it in. Like, I don't know. But it's good. And I'm absolutely convinced I know who she is now. So you've, okay. <laughs> you have talked around this around me so much to the point that you started to bring it up during DC Daily and cut yourself off. From saying it. But I'm going to say what I think you're going to say, and then you can go from there. Do you think that Jace's daughter is Anna from the beginning of this episode? That's what I put together based on things you have tried to not say around me. (laughs) This was from Morgan Jenkins. And I know that I got interesting confirmation of that now. Anyway, what weird? I, I'm gonna tell. You, I'm gonna talk about it anyway. What? <laughs> what? I'm gonna talk about what it. What confirmation? Talk. What are you talking I wouldn't, about? I wouldn't call it confirmation, but it's pretty much confirmation. What? <laughs> Rich? What? I don't know. This is like this is crazy. So Morgan Jenkins, who you guys uh, know when she was on our uh, reprint episode, messaged me, and in her original discussion episode, of course, yes. <laughs> But most recently in the reprints. Yes. She messaged me and she said, I think I know who Jace's daughter is. And I think I'm just making this up, but I have to talk to somebody about it. Do you want to know what I think? And I said, yes, please tell me. And then she told me. And my reaction was, I'm going to punch Greg and Brandon on spec. (laughs) Even without confirmation, because I'm absolutely convinced that you're right. Would you like to share with the rest of the class, Rich? I would. Jace's children are Anna and Otto from the beginning of this episode. One of the things that Young Justice does 
is they like to do things like have Carrie Payton do the voice of Aqualad and Black Manta. Gray does the voice of both Dr. Jace and Anna (laughs) in the credits. Emily is so angry right now. And this... I noticed that and like just brushed it off. I was like, huh. They had That's her interesting. Just had her do another voice, just because mm-hmm. you know sometimes mm-hmm. you need another person to do yeah. another voice for two seconds. Because they do random things in Young Justice, and it never means anything. So, it could, but as soon as Morgan told me this, my storytelling brain went to town. That means Jeff killed her daughter, <laughs> which which takes. <laughs> Emily is completely off screen at this point. I think she just laid down on the ground. (laughs) So Jeff, Ah. who probably hasn't told Jace about anything that had happened before, may have killed her daughter. But then we were talking about this and we're like, but wait, but wait. If she knew that Otto had become Plasmus, then she was on the beach when Otto was killed. Right? Right? And then there's a moment where Morgan sent me a screenshot of Jace's face in the background, like watching the situation. (laughs) And I'm like, the thing is, even if I have no other proof, one, it's my headcanon. And two, I have no definite proof. I hadn't even figured this thing out about Gray doing the voices. I have no definite proof, but it makes so such a painful storytelling sense that I am guarantee that Greg and Brandon did this. <laughs> oh, and I'm so angry and I'm so affected. <laughs> it's so good. When I realized Jeff, oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Welcome my to Crash in the Mode my episode entire, one. My entire audio track is just going to be me slamming into things because I can't. I don't have words. I've just been flailing. She has literally been flailing. Yeah, we're an audio medium. You can't see me flailing, and it doesn't like show up on an audio track except for distant banging as I fall <laughs> off my chair. But my God, that's ah, yeah. uh, because you're, right. you're right. You're right. Right. You're, you're right. No, Unless Morgan was right. But, Hats off to Morgan. Morgan listening at home. You're right. And I'm, um, I am, I like, I am emotions. <laughs> I am emotions. While you deal with your emotions, I'll go on to some more. How's that? I'm not sure anything's as gnarly as that one, but Jakuli, the speedster, had to be hired by Delam. There's a moment when he's running. Delam shoots him because he looks at Delam and Delam swings at him and he goes underneath that sword and he's got that smirk on his face. Yes. Well, that smirk, that life. smirk makes a whole different level of sense because he's like, oh, this is the guy who hired me. OK, I'll just run past him. And then he gets shot and he turns around and looks at Delam with total shock. Not that he's been shot, but that he was shot by the guy who hired him. You're right. <laughs> Yeah. One thing I caught Flip this a viewing, table. <laughs> Flip a table. One thing I caught this episode, Spoiler's Mask. Spoiler's Mask is the same mask, that darkware mask that Dick gives out to everybody else. Did you notice that? I, I was looking. After you pointed it out, I went back and looked at it. And hers is a little bit different, but it's only in like the very, very mm. close details. Like hers has some slightly different like markings on the front compared to right. theirs. But it's like... It's, it's like one brush stroke away. Right. It does make me wonder, though, like, spoiler. I don't know. It just seems like it's on theme for her if she's, like, going in somewhere and there's electronic surveillance and it's sp- spiraling her face out so she can't be seen and she's doing stuff. That would be so cool. And it's because they, they had to figure out a way to make spoilers comic book look work in the more realistic style of Young Justice. Because you look at the spoiler and you're like, that's a cool costume, but wait, how th- how does your mask do? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because every time I'm like, yeah, spoiler's costume is great, but you just have a like a bandana in front. What is that? What are you doing? So they turned it right. into like a structured face mask, which I very much like. Right, uh, right. Maybe we'll see. We'll find out. 
Emily, you had a couple. Uh, you had a couple things. You were starting to talk earlier about <laughs> and Gabriel then we cut Dow. It off and then yeah, and then uh, we put it in here. So what's what's the deal with Gabriel Dow? You were going to say. So the weirdest thing to me about Gabriel Dow's introduction in this is that she never speaks. We never hear her speak. She will eventually become Halo and all of her other stuff, but she never speaks, and we have no definite idea, honestly, because of the way this scene is set up whether letting in the assassins was an accident or not. Yes, because it, it looks to me- It is done in such a way that like, it's a 50-50 chance for me looking at this scene. Yeah. Where I'm like, I don't, I can't tell because they portray her as like nervous around the palace guards. And I'm like, is that just you are a teenage girl who is a servant or is this you are doing something that they would not like? Yeah. They- she seems a little bit surprised by the guy pushing past her to get in. Well, I think that what she's surprised with there is that he he shoves the door open into her. I think she's surprised at just being hit by a door, not that someone is right outside ready to come in. I I am absolutely convinced. From the first time I watched that, I was like, is she letting them in? And, and I don't she's, know. I can't. T- I don't know. I am like. I think she let him in. It, for me, it's a 50-50 chance. I agree I with you. There's sure. enough There's enough in there for me to be going, oh, maybe, but that's what they do, you and know? It's so, it's so crazy. And she, like, she seems confused by the speedster, but that could just be that he has powers and that she wasn't expecting someone with powers. And she seems surprised by the guy grabbing her and putting something over her face because duh but like right. she doesn't scream for the guards she does when they come in there is a moment of like you've just been pushed by a door you could scream and let people know that there are assassins yeah. here she doesn't say like but wait or who are you or she doesn't say anything she's just nope. so yeah. i don't know we like this isn't crashing the mode just because this is us wildly theorizing i have no idea no like absolutely. i love halo and halo and violet is a good person and we yeah. know this what Violet was before she became Violet, we don't know her history. We've only gotten little bits and pieces and flashes of who that character was. Right. And I don't know. I don't know. I want to know more. <laughs> my yeah, my know. general the general young justice mood is I want to know more. Yeah. I think I think we're gonna get a lot more about her past. And and you know what? This may be the reason why Halo or Violet doesn't want to bring up that she's having memories. Because Maybe. the memories may not be something she wants to accept as something that is part of who she is anymore. You they know, absolutely know. could be another quick random thing. And the scene in the scene, not this scene in this episode, uh, there's the scene in Moscow where uh, Dick is breaking into the lab, all of that. And over the comms, Oracle is talking to him. And there's a moment where both she and us, the viewer, are a little worried that Dick Grayson may have just died. Uh, and she kind of freaks out for a second. And that is made so much more meaningful by the fact that we find out later in the season that they are currently dating. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is not just him being like, oh, were you worried about me and being flirty Dick Grayson? Like Barbara genuinely has a moment where she's like, oh, my God, my boyfriend just died. Yeah. Uh, and yet, even more telling about her character, even though she has a moment where she thinks her boyfriend might be dead, she still calls him Nightwing through that entire exchange because Barbara knows that if you are on comms for the mission, you are staying on comms for the mission. If you're in a room full of people, you don't call call Batman Bruce. Unless. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, Neil had some interesting ones, and I haven't read these yet, so this is fun. Later on in the season, in episode seven, Lex makes reference to Project Rutabaga <laughs> that they have, that they have the Clarion is, is on. Uh, he says, I wonder if Project Rutabaga really is the new range soft drink uh, being released under a new name. That um, mentioned at the end of season two and the very beginning of season three. Yeah, exactly. A plan we have never heard more about. <laughs> That's right. Um, he talks about the father box. The father box that's used to make Cyborg later on in the season may very well be this father box that we saw at the beginning of this episode where that healing power was demonstrated. But they're on that planet. It might be the very same one. <laughs> um, McGann says, I've lost half my team to whatever Batman has going on, which is interesting because so she doesn't know, which seems she doesn't know what's happening there, which makes sense. So the team is the only ones that are left out because it's Dick and Barbara, Aquaman and Wonder Woman, and then Batman's team, right? In Triptych. 
no, she's there. That's why. Oh, Neil is Brock she is there? Not. Oh, she's I forgot. Because she's there with Aqualad talking to Wonder Woman, and her and Connor go and do something. They they're the ones who arrest the the guy, the guy who's in charge of stuff, whose name I'm completely forgetting, but who's the CEO of the company that they are trying to bust as part of that whole thing, that whole complicated Simon episode. Stag. Yes. So by that point, Miss Martian knows. I like to think she doesn't know here. I want to give my girl the benefit of the doubt that like she hasn't been brought in on that chaos yet. Yeah, maybe. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting because it, it may be the case. Maybe they, maybe Batman and and G A left. Maybe that episode was the like the triptych episode may have been the first p- point where they all worked together on something. Maybe yeah. we'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, it's if it's not that. We'll find out. Right, right. <laughs> Secrets don't stay buried on this show. Right. I, I had mentioned a, a while ago about Baron Bedlam being just like any villain's name of Bedlam, like just seems like a ridiculous name and how that was the character from the comics. But the way they <laughs> they changed it around to an anagram as the lamb, which yep. I don't think was in the comics. That wasn't a thing in the comics, but we first get an introduction to that with the queen which is an interesting way to do it because you introduce the queen whose last name is Delam. You've now planted it in your readers' minds that Delam is just a name, right? Yeah. And then you introduce her brother. Oh, okay, great. Oh, and the implication is, oh, his last name is Delam. Oh, okay. So they've layered this thing. They don't make it obvious from the beginning because they don't introduce yeah. him with that last name. They introduce the, the sister with the last name, which I think is an interesting way to to tuck tuck something in that should be kind of obvious. Like even Dick's like... <laughs> How did I not know that was an anagram? I feel like an idiot right now. And I'm like, I didn't know either, Nightwing. Stop beating yourself up. It's classic Batman villain. I don't know why it wasn't so obvious. Um, and that's that's pretty much it on the on the big spoilery stuff, I think, for this. Yeah. I think we've covered everything. <laughs> Sorry I knocked you over with the blame Morgan. It's Morgan's fault. Morgan, how could you do this to me? <laughs> Uh, we'll see. It hurts so good. And you know what's funny? We could be totally wrong. This is absolute. We're just making this up right now. Like we have got our tinfoil hats on full bore conspiracy theory going on with this one. We'll see. We'll see if Morgan's right. I love it. Anyway. We'll find out. <laughs> we'll find out. To wrap and up our episode. With that. Uh, I think we can say it out of the Watchtower. Uh, thank you for spending some time with us. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the yjfiles.tumblr.com, at our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that isn't enough, you can email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining us in our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you live outside the U.S. because we have to look a little harder to find those. If you are able to support us monetarily, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us do in-person interviews, actual play podcasts, fan meetups, discussion sessions, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.